the company of curlews. Chapter 1. Mithering, Shenanigans and the Swing We were up river, a little out of town, years ago now. Kids we were, heroic explorers along the river bank of the Nile, close to the port of Zanzibar. We cut our way through the dense jungle undergrowth beneath a canopy of leaves in search of Dr Livingstone, I presume. And in the river, Peter Pan's crocodile is munching on Hook's hand and liking the taste of it. It was 1952, a hazy, heavenly autumn Sunday evening. We're not really in Africa. We're on the banks of the River Towie. The gorse and bracken are thick with prickly blackthorn, and the stingiest stingies spread their tingly venom whenever they find the touch of a youngster's bare skin. But we fight on, courageously, out into the open. In the river there is a swirl of salmon. How many we don't know. We've seen them before. The river is black with them. My younger brother Anthony is with us. I need a dock leaf. He's scratching the lower part of his leg. He's ten years old. Our uncle Di is with us. Struggling we been through the bushes. The shoelaces his mother tied for him earlier have been pulled loose by the thorns. He bends down. Ties a double knot. Let me explain. Uncle Di is a funny one. He's the same age as me. We're twelve years old. I'm a little older. My mother and Nana pregnant at the same time. We were more than related, though. We were good mates. Di, the nicest man in the world. Calm, thoughtful, smile for everyone. Best friend, best uncle anyone could ever wish for. Always saw the good in people. Now in the bulrushes, close to the river, virtually out of sight, lies the flat-out body of blind Dick Salmon. A bottle of booze by his side. He lies as if laid out in a coffin, palms crossed across his chest. Look, says Anthony, it's Dick Salmon, he points. He's heard stories of blind Dick, a sweet man when sober who in drink would lose his head, and with a flip of a coin the red mist would descend. I'd never seen him sober. Don't wake him, says Di. How did he get there, I say? He looks dead, though. Whoa! i never seen a man with such big ears. Is he sleeping? Anthony looks to Di for an answer. Leave him alone, says Di. Leave the sleeping dog lie. That's what my father says. He's been to jail, he has, I say, pulling Anthony away from getting too close to Dick. Dick wakes from his Sunday afternoon shut eye. I'm not dead. He pulls out a knife from his trench coat. Now leave me alone, you scallywags, or the knife will taste your blood. Get away with you. Stop mithering me. He swipes the knife back and forth in our direction. We leg it, sprinting as fast as. I know your father, boy. He's waving the knife at die. We get to a safe distance and stop, heavy out of breath. Lungs burning. We all laugh out loud at our great escape. 
Hush, boys. Stand still, look, says Dye pointing. I don't know about you, but when anybody points, I'm like a dog and look, look the other way. All I see is a robin dancing about amongst the red berries of a hawthorn bush. Oh, aye, I say, not that impressed. Look, Jackman, he points again. Ahead of us, in the shallows of the approaching curve of the river, a brown-eyed curlew is cautiously wading, its long down-curved bill unmistakable. He's there, honestly, probing the mud for a square evening meal of worm or beetle. The three of us stand still. The bird stops abruptly, sees us at a distance. With head still, its eyes twitch towards us. It's not trusting of our presence. It jerks its head, chicken style, up and right and left and down, and the curlew lays its eyes on me. Who are you looking at, I think to myself. Without moving now, it's looking down its beak at me. My mother used to look at me over her glasses. Judging us, she was. Naughty we were. Usually when she was about to lose her temper. You too? Sending me do lal, get out, she would shout. The irony of those words, do lal. And you die out. Die never did anything wrong, but he had the wrath of my mother, whatever. Back on the river bank, the curlew stirs from its steady gaze. It takes off, gives out its haunting call. The curly chirrup cascades up from the river as it launches into its bubbling song flight. You talking to me, I think to myself. It flies down the river across a blood-red sunset, the silhouetted god of the heavens. Keep your eye out, says Di. Might see more later on now. What time is supper, Jack? Anthony asks me. When it's ready, I tell him. That's what Nana Loll always says. Isn't it, Di? That's what your mam says. Out of the blue, I decide to pounce on Anthony, knock him over in a play fight, little John and Robin Hood. We wrestle, I pin him down in a small skirmish, holding his head on the grassy floor. Submit, I say. I'll give you my conquer, he cries. Submit, I say, I don't want your conquer. He was a stubborn little man, never would submit. We get up, we put our arms around each other, and he looks up to me, smiles, and takes out one of his best conkers. I don't want your conquer, Ants. You're okay. I give him a friendly, brotherly squeeze. You shouldn't fight like that, Jackman, says Di. You could hurt each other. Ugh, so serious, Di, I say. Come on, says Di. We're late, mind. We need to get home, quick as. Mum will have the bath ready, front of the fire. My brother, Anthony, had moseyed off, staring at the eddies he is. You're too close, Ants, I say. He looks at me. Why? He shouts. It's something an annoying three-year-old would say. He is standing on an overhang of the river bank, pointing at the fish, taking it all in, pleasing him as they run up river. But the undercut of the bank could collapse any minute. That's what our grandfather Owen had always told us. Anthony can't swim. He'd have to save himself. Because I'm not very good either. You're too close. It's dangerous. Do I have to explain everything to him? Anthony doesn't listen to me. Edges closer to the undercut. Die, realising that I'm starting to lose my patience 
Put an arm around my brother. Yeah, come on, Hans. Let's go skimming, he says. Maddening, Anthony, is maddening. Don't know nothing. There's something or other all the time with him. He's got on my nerves. Here we are then, I say, whatever. And I walk on. The two of them start looking for stones to skim from the bank. Dye is explaining to Anthony that he needs to find special stones. Flat, skimming ones. Not too heavy, not too light. Ones that fit into the natural curve of his first finger. You need an edge so you can spin it off your finger, he says. See, bend down, close as you can to the surface. Aim out a bit into the river, he says. Swing back and then quickly forward and let it go. Five, six, seven, eight. Dye's stone skips along the skin of the water, comes to a stop on the seventh, sinking down to the depths on the eighth. It was seven, laughs Anthony. Dye bends down again, starts looking for another flat stone. Hans, he calls him over. Here you are, boy. That there is the perfect skimming stone. Put it in your pocket. Keep it for another day. I can hear something not far off. I hold my arm up to my brow, shade my eyes from the setting sun. In the distance, a small gang of school friends are larking about. Uh, shenanigans. I can see the gang up ahead, taking turns. They run half-naked, jump and launch their bodies off the riverbank. There's no thought of technique, no baggage of whether they'll make it or not. They just do it. They catch it high with a vice-like grip, and legs follow body and criss-cross lock around the dangling rope, slipping down until they sense the awkward knot between their legs. They swing above the silted inlet like oversized conkers. There's plenty of water in a pool. They let go and swim back to the safety of the grassy bank. Give us a go, I say, dropping my trousers, virtually ripping a shirt off my back. I throw myself towards the rope, take hold, pump my legs up and down and lean backwards. Creating a bigger arc. I release, landing back on the bank like a gymnast finishing a vault. There's even a cheer from the crowd. Go on, Hans, have a go, I say. Yeah, go on, Hans, says Di. Your turn, boy. You can do it. If only he had put a bit of effort in, he'd reach it without any problem. Anthony's concrete feet stick to the riverbank, his upper body pole axes towards the gently swaying hemp rope. His upper body nose dives down towards the depths of the twenty-two. Nobody jumps in to help? Nah. They watch, bent over, belly laughing at Anthony's mishap. I'm not happy with them laughing, uh, but I freeze. I found my brother a bit embarrassing at the time. Ralph Richards is watching me. He's 15. He's older. He sees I'm not joining in with a guffawing at my brother's uselessness. Your brother's a scream, Jackman. He pokes me, intimidating like in the shoulder. I smile awkwardly, think better of it, and join in with the others, laughing at my brother. Come on, you big ninny, I shout. Get out of there. The cruelty of youth to watch someone struggling towards the relative safety of the far side, the muddy side. Anthony won't call out for help. There he is, manically climbing the steps of an invisible ladder, flapping his arms like the front paws of a dog 
until he is able to crawl out onto the mud banks the other side. Uncle Di has run around the inlet to pull him out. Anthony sits there, exhausted in his wife fronts, his hair flat against his skin, curtain in his eyes. His body heaves to find its breath. He slowly sweeps his hair from his face and reveals. I can see him there now. And reveals the hard stare of shame and humiliation. I felt this sadness. It ached deep inside me.